Well, I think we are all mic'd and ready to go. And, and first, let me say uh, I really appreciate it. I know the, the schedule of a senator is extremely busy. Uh, so I very much appreciate both of you taking the time to come over here. And I, I think this is the first time we've had either one of you at Cato, so I hope it's not the last and certainly want to welcome. And I certainly should thank my friends at American Financial Reform for also making this, this possible today as a joint effort. Um, so we're going to talk about the Federal Reserve today. Uh, I think one of the things that really sort of shook me and shook much of the public during 2008, 2009, were all these things happening that none of us really knew could happen. You know? And every day it was something new. Uh, and I think the public was used to seeing the Fed in this monetary role and said, wow, I didn't know they could do that. Um, and so the reaction, of course, in Dodd-Frank's uh, Section 1101 was to say, let's tighten this up. Let's make sure that this is targeted toward everybody, not one off. Let's make sure it's solvent, that we aren't bailing out firms. We're just helping those that have a little bump in the road. Um, and of course, about 20 months ago, the Federal Reserve proposed a rule, which in my opinion was largely just re re restating the statute. Uh, and so I'd you know, like to start the conversation with, uh, you know, is this something that the Fed can do on their own? Uh, if let's hope that the Fed was listening now and if there was something you could say to them in terms of when we see a final rule, you know, what should it look like? David, do you want to start? Sure. Well, first of all, let me back up a little bit and say that I think the fact that we're here together working together on this illustrates how broad and legitimate the concern across America is with too big to fail. And the fact that it is unfortunately alive and well, and if another crisis happened, uh, we're convinced we'd see it again, all over again, same old, same old. And I think the American public is really concerned about that, left, right, and middle. I think it is a very broad-based concern. And the fact that we're sort of the political odd couple, I don't know if I'm Felix or Oscar, but working on this, <laughs> um, I, I think it proves how deep and legitimate and broad-based that concern is. So I just wanted to say that up front. Uh, secondly, could the Fed uh, fix this on its own? Uh, certainly. Uh, have they? Absolutely not. And it's very clear, as you suggested, with everything they have put out, they absolutely want to preserve maximum flexibility, their ability to really do whatever they want particularly in a crisis. And that, look, I, I'm not going to say that's some um, evidence of uh, some evil hidden agenda. That's sort of the natural impulse for an agency, to, to have as many tools in the toolbox as possible to not restrict themselves uh, maximum flexibility. I just don't think that is good, because if it happens again, I think we would be assured of same old, same old, bailing out insolvent institutions, very focused bailouts, not at all broad-based. And so that's why Elizabeth and I think this legislation, which would preclude that, is required. So uh, obviously, I agree with David on this. I, I think he's exactly right. This is about too big to fail. Uh, and about what it means to the American people. It's about what it means to this economy. And trying to find a way to back up from that. It was all created in 2008, 2009. We know about TARP. There was a lot of focus on 700 billion. You know, try Googling 700 billion and see how many people were talking about TARP. But what a lot fewer people were talking about was how the Fed was shoveling money out the back door in a very quiet way to support not the financial system overall, but to support very targeted financial institutions. Nine trillion dollars, your money, nine trillion tax dollars, went out the door to just three financial institutions. And it stayed there on average for about 22 months that this money went out. And yes, it was loan money. But at an interest rate that I guarantee those three financial institutions couldn't get anywhere in the world except from the Federal Reserve. So what we're talking about, our bill actually has a real history to it in a sense. It has a, it has a kind of pedigree to it. So the first part is too big to fail. The second part is the response in Dodd-Frank. And so in Dodd-Frank, Congress came together, it's before I was there, but Congress came together and they said, look, if the Fed is going to lend any money in the future, 
in times of distress. We want to know that it is a system-wide problem, not just that one or two financial institutions has a specific problem, but that it's, it's system-wide, and that the problem the financial institution has is not a problem of insolvency. That is, they have made some terrible bets in the market and they're now upside down, but that the problem they've got is one of liquidity because the market itself is freezing up. And so Congress, I think quite reasonably, and Dodd-Frank said those are in effect the goals and told the Fed to implement that. The Fed, as you rightly say, proposed a rule that I kind of read that rule to say, <laughs> not really, um, because the Fed said, oh, system-wide facility, okay, we probably can't say one. Congress would probably get really aggravated about that. <laughs> So they said two, two counts as system-wide, that's it. So that's all they've got to show is that you've got two financial institutions that are in here asking for money, in effect, at the same time. And the second part of it, as, as they're going through the, the how system-wide is this, then the next question is, is this a financial institution that's insolvent? And I've got to tell you here, the Fed says, oh, we know how to measure insolvent if they haven't yet filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> now, I want you just to think about that for a minute, because the way I read that is they said, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a little cart right in front of the bankruptcy courthouse. And any large financial institution that has prepared the paper just as it is headed to the courthouse will just intercept and say, would you like a trillion dollars from us instead? Uh, because you will qualify because you have not yet climbed the steps and dropped the piece of paper that files for bankruptcy. Let's face it, that is both not what Congress intended in Dodd-Frank, but it is also not what we need in order to try to beat back the too-big-to-fail problem. So what Senator Vitter and I have proposed is just to go back over those three parts. And we talk about system-wide, and we say, we didn't think we'd have to do this by statute, but come on, guys, five institutions. You know, let's at least get the number up that we think we've got multiple institutions here. Insolvency, you guys got to get out there and certify that this is not an insolvent financial institution that's getting this money. At least you're going to have to put your name behind it. And the third part, by the way, is this should be at a penalty rate of interest. So it should be five points above what the T-bill is. The point here is not to give you below market rates so that we can subsidize you. The point is to say, if you're having to turn to the Fed for help in a crisis, then the Fed in that sense should be like other market lenders. Yeah, they'll be there as lender of last resort, but you're gonna have to pay something extra for it and your shareholders are gonna have to pay something extra for it. So, we still give the Fed the capacity to move in, but we feel like we've tried to at least put some curbs on this so that we can get too big to fail under better control. I, I think that's an incredibly important aspect in reminding people that markets don't work without fair. I was just trying to remember, I, I think the Warren Buffett deal with Goldman was something like 10%. Yeah. So, so um, let's try to deal with, I mean, you know, neither one of you will be surprised that there's been some criticism. So let's try to raise a couple of what those criticisms have been. Uh, I won't name them, but a recent Federal Reserve official testified before Congress. His initials are BB. <laughs> no, no. Is that the one you're talking about? I was about? actually talking oh, about his, going to another his, one. His, <laughs> an, an, another one who, who, oh, okay. who basically kind of, who made the argument that, um, you know, we really don't know at the time who's, who's insolvent. You know, we can't figure this out at the time. You know, forcing the Fed to decide at the time who's insolvent, you know, is difficult. And you, you kind of have to just trust our judgment. So I'd like to get a response to that argument. Really? <laughs> well, I'm trying to be generous to the, the but critics. No, but I'm serious. Really? These are supposed to be the supervisors and regulators who are out there looking at the books assessing the, the assets every single day. That's their job, that they're doing it on a regular basis. And if we're heading into a crisis, it's not like we all get up one morning and with no warning at all, whoa, it's 11.15 and suddenly there's a financial crisis upon us. It, you know that there's trouble. Trouble starts uh, uh, identifying itself. That means they should be stepping up their scrutiny 
of these institutions. They should be looking more carefully than they do in times when everything looks steady. The idea that they can't tell, it, if that is a serious statement, I was a then I am genuinely terrified. Um, <laughs> I, I so I'm, I'm going to assume that not really is the I answer. Well, yeah. I agree. I think they clearly have the ability to ascertain that. And I think, looking in the past, we can clearly say that most of these cases we're talking about were insolvencies. Yeah. And we knew it at the time. And, it, and it certainly, with Robert, almost any of this will be publicly traded companies that have quarterly right. earnings. And there'll be auditors that are in there. We're not talking a community bank that's only you know, regulated or examined and, every other year. And Mark, if I can jump in, I think the other important thing all of these curbs do is our goal is not simply to limit alternatives in a crisis. Our goal is to do this way ahead of time so that we do other things to head off a crisis. Yeah. Uh, and I think having all of these opportunities and unlimited powers um, really um, uh, is reason for the feds and others not to do things uh, ahead of time to avoid the crisis. Yeah, similarly, to me, I think the, the argument I sometimes I feel like I hear is kind of the stuff happens argument that, you know, well, you're going along, everything's fine, and then boom, some shock out of the blue, and then we've got to bail these guys out like we didn't see it coming. Yeah. And so I certainly worry, and I'd be curious whether you share this concern, by having the expectation of this facility, we change the behavior of the companies themselves and their creditors and their counterparties. Right. Um, and is that a concern that we need it, to absolutely. You see, I think that goes right to the heart of it. And this is what David and I have talked about more than once. And, and that is, if you advertise to the market that the Fed is here and no need for any large financial institution ever to have to go to the bankruptcy courthouse or to declare itself insolvent, but instead there will be trillions of dollars available to back up these giant institutions, I think that changes fundamentally the behavior of the big banks themselves, the behavior of those who lend them money, the behavior of those who invest in them. And I got to say, in all three cases, not for the better, because it encourages riskier behavior knowing that there is an option available. And Mark, if stuff happens, the legitimate question is, OK, does having this facility available all over again encourage or discourage bad stuff to happen? I think it clearly encourages it. And that's exactly what we're, those are the dynamics we're trying to change. There's been study after study after study that says number one, too big to fail is alive and well. Number two, it gives mega banks a market advantage, a lower cost of capital, other market advantages that are simply unfair in the market and um, uh, onerous to competitor institutions. So, so we want to change that dynamic of stuff happening. That's also why I'm working on another piece of legislation with Sherrod Brown to um, put protections like greatly increased capital requirements for mega banks, which I think is a much more systemic approach to, allow, uh, to avoiding these sorts of crises. Yeah, I mean, I think the evidence is pretty clear that, that these have resulted in higher leverage than we would have otherwise. Right. And, you know, it's important to rely on the financial regulators, but, you know, to me it's also important that, I mean, let's say I had a billion dollars to lend you. If I did lend it to you, I'd probably care what you did with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have that expectation. And the, the, I think I remember that Lehman had at least three offers to be bought. Yeah. And every time they were like, no, we, we got this back. We got a better here. deal uh, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you, you've got to think about that in terms of the behavior that encourages from Lehman, from its creditors up. But it's also what it does to a market overall. So you're a community bank, you're a small bank, you're a mid sized bank, but you're not going to be too big to fail. You're out there competing for capital, you're competing for investments, and you're competing against somebody that doesn't just have a government guarantee, they've got a government guarantee for free to back them up. And the more you keep that playing field tilted over time, the more we'll see more concentration in the industry. You just, you're driving one set of competitors out of business and advantaging another set of competitors, a set of competitors that ultimately pose far greater risk to the economy. And again, there have been multiple studies that actually quantify that effect in terms of market advantage, lower cost of capital. 
So to me, the ultimate irony is uh, we come out of the crisis, too big to fail, et cetera. And I think mostly what we've done is greater, created a greater disadvantage to the smaller players who essentially had nothing to do with the crisis. Thanks. So we've tilted the playing field even further in favor of mega banks against smaller community banks credit unions. Yeah, and, I, and I agree that this is a lot of this has to be about leveling the playing foot. I want to go back and, and again, my reaction when I heard this criticism was really two. So, but, but let's get it out there <laughs> yeah. just to, to deal with it. So one of the arguments is that a penalty rate of 5% will scare away anybody from using this facility. I mean, they'll say instead, <laughs> I'm going bankrupt. I am not going to pay five extra points. Mm -hmm. Please. I mean, it, it's just an alternative view of human behavior that I just, I don't buy. Uh, they sold to Warren Buffett Don't at 10 points, right? Uh, and are borrowed from, from yeah. Buffett. And it, it, the idea that you won't do it here just makes no sense to me. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, what, I mean, part of this should be making the Fed actually a lender of last resort rather than a rescuer of first resort. Right. Um, and that's, I'd love to see the Fed to come up with a similar rule on its own. Uh, but quite frankly, even if they were to do that tomorrow, which they're not going to, you know, my concern would be that they can change that at a moment's notice in the middle of a crisis, too. So I think for all sorts of reasons, it's better to have not every little detail, but broad parameters like we're talking about in statute. So, you know, how do we kind of make this, you know, keep, hold the Fed's feet to the fire? I mean, we recently had one court decision that said they lent they, against equity and they weren't supposed to do that. And Nothing happened yeah, at the That's Fed. the problem. Right. So, so th that seems to me you got to hold it. Let me you know, ask a different thing. And I guess I should, should say this is a, an, odd, a, an odd pairing is used that, that's worked because uh, last night a, a bill on GSE compensation that the two of you right. offered passed. So, right. the Senate. Yay. so congratulations. <laughs> Let's hope that's the, the first of many. Um, I'm curious from the conversations you have with your colleagues what the interest is uh, in the rest of the Senate in this approach. I will note there, there's a House companion, I think Mr. Capuano and Garrett, mm -hmm. um, but, but what's your sense of the rest of the interest in the Senate in this? What, what's your sense? You've been there longer. Uh, I think, look, I, I think this is sort of a, a competition between two factors. Number one, uh, the public's legitimate concern with too big to fail, uh, favoring mega banks, all of that, that broad-based discussion. Number two, the insider game of these institutions, quite frankly, being very powerful and influ influential. And so to me, it's a pretty simple calculus. The question is, how big is the public debate and is it getting big enough to counteract the insider special interest game? Yeah. And to me, that's the, the political fight that's going on. And so far, quite frankly, the public debate hasn't been big enough, loud enough, to overcome the special interest game, but I think it's growing in that direction. I, 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 think, I think David's right on this. I always think of it this way, that, that the public interest here, there is no army of lobbyists representing them. There is no army of lawyers uh, coming in every day to talk to every Senate staff to, uh, uh, to make sure that their, their position is well known. And this is, for me, this is just one more version of democracy. The question is, will, will the insiders control the game? Those who've got the lobbyists, those who've got a lot of money on the table, but a very small insular group that, frankly, wants to enhance its profits at the expense of the public? Or will we really be there to represent the people who are affected by this, both in the overall financial system and, God forbid, when we hit the next crisis. And Mark, I'll give you an example. Months ago, one of the early things I did with others is to have language uh, mandating a study of the cost of too big to fail and quantifying that, which is what I alluded to. Pure study by objective analysts. Uh, the mega bank lobbyists came out of the woodwork in enormous full force. I, I mean, I, I kn knew they were there. I certainly understood they would oppose it. It still, it stunned me to the extent that they came out in full force about doing a study and putting some numbers on it. So that's the insider game I was trying to describe. We need to overcome that with the broad-based public debate. 
Yeah, I, I used to often say and still say there's there's no broad there's no narrowly defined constituency for financial stability, unfortunately. That's right. And of course one of the reasons we're here today is try to create that. Um, We've all got money on the table. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That's right. Mm -hmm. it, it, oh, and so, you know, when you're taking on this this status quo establishment, you know, I find that it's incredibly important, which is one reason that, that Cato on one hand is working with Americans for Financial Reform to try to build a coalition around this. Uh, and again, you had a bill passed yesterday, you, you've got this one. Um, is this the beginning? Are there other things that you and David might be able to work out or that you're already thinking about that you'd like to tell us about? Or Yeah, I mean, we're bouncing ideas uh, off each other, with each other all the time, and other colleagues on the banking committee and, and other colleagues in the Senate. I mentioned my ongoing effort with Sherrod Brown and others about higher capital requirements for mega banks. So we have a whole uh, spectrum and suite of ideas we're working on. Mm -hmm. But it principally circles around where, where David started the conversation, and that is, too big to fail is not over. And it is our responsibility in the United States Senate and the United States House of Representatives to do everything we can to turn the rules in the direction of taking away the advantages that the too big to fail banks enjoy in this marketplace and in this political system. That, that's our job, and we work at it as many different ways as we can, and this is one of them. So part of, part of the too big to fail, while obviously there's investor perceptions, there's activities of the bank, the other side of it seems to be me, maybe the lack of courage or, or willingness on the part of the regulators to step in. And I fundamentally see the bill partly as about, you know, I think about Ulyss Ulysses between the sirens and the rock, and, and how do you resist that? Or I think of it as the two sides of the trash compactor in Star Wars. Yeah. Big, uh, same thing. Same thing. Uh -huh. so, so some of this is, you know, how do we, you know, essentially effectively limit the choice of regulators? I'd like to think that if I was in German Bernanke or German Jelenseed, I would probably do something different. But you don't know that you're there. Tremendous amount of pressure, nonstop calls from Wall Street. Oh my God, if we don't do something. So, so how do we help strengthen their backbones? You know, I am reminded that the United States Senate not only has the power to pass laws, which is what we're trying to work on, but it also has responsibility for oversight of the regulatory agencies. We both sit on the banking committee, we have regulatory oversight responsibilities. And that means bringing in these regulators and asking them the tough questions. It means in between the times that we have hearings, writing them letters, calling them. That's how we actually started, was with starting with letters Correct. to mm -hmm. stay after them. Look, it's not always the headline news, but it's doing the hard homework of whether or not these agencies are doing their jobs not to represent the biggest financial institutions, but to represent the American people. And I think part of our job, and I take this very seriously, and I know that, that David does too, is to hold the regulator's feet to the fire. And Mark, I think part of what you're asking, at least from my perspective, I'll, I'll just talk from my own perspective, because this may be a little bit more of a conservative one. Um, to, to me, a big part of the problem with the Dodd-Frank response was that it was completely dependent on more regulations and more regulators versus something more systemic, something more akin to an invisible hand that doesn't depend on humans understanding and reacting in real time. I'd much rather depend on that systemic fix versus just shoving more regulators in the room and more regulations on institutions. And that's where we're going with the higher capital requirement. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like after the crisis, uh, the regulators and others said, you know, we had a lot of folks focused on it and they were smart, but, but now we're gonna have a whole lot more and they're really gonna be super smart. That's to, that's to me not reassuring. Uh, we need something more systemic versus more humans, more regulations shoved into the equation, some of which are uh, counterposed to each other and inconsistent with each other. So I want to pick up on David's point because I think that, that we really do have two ways to think about the big financial institutions. And one is you just keep layering on regulations as he talks about. The other is what kind of structural changes you can make to try to get the market to work better in this area. And I'm just going to make a pitch here for why I want to see Glass-Steagall 
reimposed. If you divide the biggest financial institutions and say, look, if you want to do a, a regular a, a banking, commercial banking, you want to take deposits and you want to have savings accounts and checking accounts, that's great. Go do that. But it means you can engage in the high risk trading that occurs on Wall Street. And if you want to do the high risk trading, that's great, but you're not going to get access to grandma's savings account. These, these two are going to be separated. I just want to point out, you do something like that, not only will that bring down the size of the biggest financial institutions immediately, but the second thing it does is it cuts the need for a lot of intrusive regulation. Because you say, the institutions we are most concerned about protecting, the ones that have our savings accounts and checking accounts, are now a simpler operation, easier to see, and much easier to regulate with a simpler set of rules. And as for those who want to take more risks on Wall Street, we'll design a set of rules for them. So I think part of the problem we've got right now is that layer on layer of regulations are needed because these institutions have been permitted to get so large, so intertwined, so complex to run business models that there are some allegations that even their own management are having a hard time understanding, right. and then throwing a bunch of regulators into that to say, you stay on top of it and see how it works. I think we need structural change. Right. Structural change like capital, like Glass-Steagall. And Mark, let me say, I'm not on that bill yet, although I'm very interested in it, but it is, <laughs> it is uh, a much more systemic approach yes. like I was broadly describing. Yes, it is. Yeah, I kind of think about it either as rules versus discretion or bright lines. And, and again, that's you know, also my approach. I think we can have a stronger and simpler you know, regulatory system. Of course, my, my little pet peeve is the capital standards. And you know, every time they tell us they're going to do these risk weightings and it's going to be ever more complicated. Right, right. And it's just more and more yep. opaque. Right. And of course, yep. I think right. we've seen the various rounds of the Basel Accords ended up with lower capital right. rather than more. That's so why I'm very sympathetic to a flat, simple leverage ratio that everybody can kind of read yep. and, and right. know. Um, so I do think that that, to me, is where the left-right kind of deal is. Simpler, stronger, mm -hmm. you know, more transparent. Um, let me raise, you know, the Senate also has a very unique role in that you do nominations. And, and I know you've... So I've heard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so I, and I know you've uh, expressed, you know, opinion on, on some of them. And, and I also, you know, to me, a good example of, you know, I look at Tom Honig going over to FDIC is somewhere where the right and left have agreed mm -hmm. that this is a guy who wants to make sure we end bailouts. Um, and is this something where the banking committee, or really other committees in general, can be more aggressive? Is this something we should be asking Federal Reserve nominees? What is your opinion on 13-3? Sure. What is your opinion on well, that? I, I think Elizabeth and I have both <laughs> right. are already there. We're both aggressive about that. We've also championed and advanced and actually got in the law a requirement that at least one Federal Reserve Board member now have true community bank experience. Um, you know. In the 50s and 60s, that wasn't necessary. The Federal Reserve was a true cross-section mm -hmm. of a lot of different types of background, smaller banks, ag, Main Street, as well as Wall Street. There's been a very clear trend in the last 30 years in favor almost exclusively of ac academics, and they're not evil per se, don't get me wrong. And per se? <laughs> <laughs> I would just presume that they're able to go from there, but <laughs> academics and big bank Wall Street types. Now, they should be able to be on the board. They shouldn't be the entire makeup of the board, and that has been the trend line. And so we started changing that with this modest requirement now that at least one member have a major community bank experience. I think that's a great start. I mean, despite having a PhD in economics, I, I am concerned about the Fed. And again, it's not a left-right thing. It's just it's become so dominated by academic economists and their models being divorced from the real world. I'll, I'll note that I could never find in Section 10 of the Federal Reserve Act the requirements for members saying anything about economists. It's, mm -hmm. you know, commerce and industry. Right. Right. And I do think having that broader base. So I know we're, we're, we're running low on time. So first of all, before I give you a little bit of a moment for uh, some final words, you know, I personally want to thank uh, your terrific staff, uh, Bharat Ramamurti, 
and Travis Johnson have been great to work with and really owe a lot of credit for making today happen. Um, but in our last couple of minutes, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, to reflect on where we're going, what the, what the chances of this are, and what our next step should be. Well, I, I think this discussion and this trend line is really positive in a couple of ways. First of all, it's uh, people from all parts of the spectrum coming together around a very real, legitimate, common concern. We need more of that in Washington and the country, period. And I think this is a positive example of that. And number two, it's elevating the debate about something that's really important. And to me, it's simple. Uh, the, the more this debate is really advanced in the public, the more these solutions are going to be successful, the more support we'll get from our colleagues. It goes back to that simple battle between a public debate and an insider's game. And the bigger and louder and more significant the public debate is, the more we're going to win in terms of these solutions. Mm -hmm. And I would just add, the issue around too big to fail is too big for politics. We can't just leave this to business as usual, that a group of insiders will influence those with power, and as a result, we'll end up with a set of rules that work for the very largest financial institutions, but don't work for other financial institutions, and sure as heck, don't work for the American economy and don't work for the American people. So for me, that's what this is all about. It's about trying to say, it is time to end too big to fail. It is still a serious issue in this economy, and more importantly, it is a serious issue in politics. And we're trying to find a way to beat it back and to get us back to an economy that works better, not just for those at the top, but for everyone. Well, I sincerely really appreciate both of you coming Thanks, over, over here today, and I promised I'd get you out on you a good amount of time. I will ask the audience to stay seated while the senators leave so they can get back to the hill interrupted, and I really do appreciate uh, both of you. Thank you. Thank you.